Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everybody. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Praise God. I'm so glad to be here tonight. I appreciate the presence of God. Such a marvelous move of the Spirit already. I appreciate the Holy Ghost. I got my young mother with me tonight. She, I said, Mama, it's a long trip. And there's lots of curves. Lots of mountains. Because we, we come through Gilbert. Y'all know where Gilbert is? And we come through Red Jacket. And uh, we come through, uh, I like to think some of my mother names. But, hey amen, we come that way. I'm sure there's a lot of ways to come. Somebody said, well, heaven's like getting somewhere else. No, there's just one heaven, and there's just one way. And there's not 15 different ways to get to heaven, just one. Praise God, and I'm glad I know his name tonight. The author and the finisher of our faith, so good. I want to introduce her tonight, my mama. Just, mom, stand and testify, obey the Lord, whatever you Amen. I hope I act like that when I'm 81. <laughs> Praise God. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Let's try to give off my voice a little rough tonight, but I'll give that. Y'all want to help me? You can. Well, I'm going to a city 1,500 miles long. Well, I'm going to a city 1,500 miles long. Well, it's coming down from heaven. There's room for everyone. Well, I'm going to a city 1,500 miles long. Oh, yes, I'm going to a city 1,500 miles long. Well, it's coming down from heaven. Room for everyone. Well, the name 
of the city, New Jerusalem. Oh, yes, the name of the city, New Jerusalem. Well, it's coming down from heaven, room for everyone. Well, I'm going to a city 1,500 miles long. Oh, yes, I'm going to a city 1,500 miles long. Well, it's coming down from heaven, room for everyone. Come on, help me now. To a city 1,500 miles long. Yes, I'm going to a city. 1,500 miles on. Well, it's coming down from heaven. Room for everyone. Oh, yeah. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Woo! Come on, let's praise Him in the house. Well, I'm going to a city whose builder and maker is God. Well, I'm going to a city whose builder and maker is God. Heaven, room for everyone. Well, I'm going to a city 1,500 miles long. Yes, I'm going to a city. 1,500 miles long. Well, it's coming down from heaven. Room for even you. Well, I'm going to a city. 15, I oh, feel the Holy Ghost. Well, I'm going to a city. 1,500 miles long. Coming down from heaven. Room for every. Help me now. Gonna sing, gonna shout on the streets that a solid go. Gonna sing, gonna shout on the streets that a solid go. Well, it's coming down from heaven. Room for everyone. Well, I'm going to a city. 1500. I'm about ready to go, aren't you? Going to a city 1,500 miles long. Well, it's coming down. A room for it. Come on, let's see. Oh, I feel him walking. Woo! Come on, praise him in the house just a little while. My God, he's worthy. Well, I'm going to a city 1,500 miles long. Reaches all the way from Maine to Florida. Going to a city 1,500 miles long. Well, it's coming down. There's room for everyone. Gonna sing, gonna shout through the city 1,500 miles long. I'm going to sing, going to shout through the city 1,500 miles long. Well, it's coming down. There's room for. Come on, put your hands together and love him in the house. Woo! Come on, put your hands together. Somebody shout, there's victory in the name of Jesus. Is it okay? I hate to be the first one to preach on this in a little way because I don't don't want to mess it up. Praise God. So I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Isn't he good to us? Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me to the book of Matthew. 
24. No, it's actually 23. Matthew 23 and 37. And also into the book of John. Chapter 13. Read my two scriptures. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How oft would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicken, her chickens under her wings. Everybody say, you would not. So behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. But Jesus began to weep. I thought as he wept for this particular situation. And he cried, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. It wasn't just a normal weeping. It was literally a cry and a desperation. It was a voice that probably literally almost shook the valleys and the mountains as he cried, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How many times would I have gathered you? How often would I have gathered you, my children? He, there's something about when you plead with your children. It's unlike anything else. Pleading for your children moves you to a dimension that's beyond any other thing in your life. Because nothing is quite as precious as a mother that watches her child being born and from her own self and as a dad as they watch the children come forth and there from that moment of conception all the way through life there's something precious about the children. I dare say that not a mother in the house tonight has had a sick and a child that was on the moment and the brink of going into eternity and you would hear the cries in the house. Oh, oh, please God, please Jesus. Somewhere in the desperation voice there was a mother that cried for the children. Thank God tonight I, I did bring my mama because thank God for a crying mother 37 years ago when the voice of my mother rang through the eternities of eon and God said I'm going to find that son I'll find him somehow I come to tell you tonight you got a praying mama or a praying grandma you swell throw in the towel because somehow God will reach down through the midst of all the ungodliness all of the unrighteousness and he will begin to do a work of intercession that is beyond the comprehension of the mind it's the ability of God that he puts in the heart of an intercessor. Somebody shout I'm an intercessor. Oh, somebody shout I'm an intercessor. I'm not here to play church or play games. We are serious tonight. God speaking to me this afternoon. The cry of a father wasn't just the cry of Jesus on a hill for a few sheep. It was literally the father of creation. Creator of heaven and earth. And every man child. And every woman child. And every creation of God. I got to let you sit down. Let me I'll preach. I, let me read this other scripture. Amen. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Somebody shout hallelujah. I feel the preacher in the house. I feel my help's in this place tonight. My help comes from the Lord. His name is a strong and a mighty tower. Come on, I believe Him. I feel Him. I sense the power of His direction tonight. Clap your hands and make a joyful noise under the Lord and shout with a voice of triumph. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody ought to talk in tongues and magnify God all over this house. Come on, let everything that hath breath praise ye the name of the Lord. Oh, Rasha Haka Rinde Amosha Tababahai Adonamokosai. Hallelujah. Can you clap your hands one more time? Let me read one more scripture. One more scripture. Found in John. 13 and 27. 
And let me, let me just back up. St. John 13. <laughs> and I'll read. Uh, let me just start around 26. Or 25. He, he then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him. Lord, who is it? Somebody look at your friend and say, who is it? The question was, somebody's going to betray Jesus. It was a troubling of the spirit. The disciples looked one at another, doubting of whom he speak. They didn't know of anybody. They didn't know the sin that was just beyond the gates of Judas's heart. They couldn't conceive it. They didn't have a revelation sitting on the platform that he was the guilty one. Somebody said to me, he said, Brother Hart, why don't we have a sense and understand? Well, let me, let me read this before I preach. Amen. Somebody, they always didn't have me because I, I preach and then I read my verse. So I'm going to read my verse and let you be seated just for a moment. Amen. Somebody say, who is it? Jesus answered and said, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And then it was just a morsel. It was a nugget. It was, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about it. But after, everybody say, after the sop. Satan literally entered into Judas and then said Jesus unto him, Thou that thou doest, do it quickly. Verse 28 says, No now. Everybody say now. now. No man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. The desperate last call is what I want to preach to you tonight. The desperate last call. Would you speak that with me as we pray? The desperate last call. Lord, tonight as I see America staggering to and fro, and I understand, God, that your church must tonight rise to the occasion. What a beautiful homecoming we're having right now, God. The singing and the shouting and the glorifying of your name. I feel tribute tonight. I pay tribute to your name. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost breaking fetters, tearing down strongholds, healing cancers, taking out tumors. God, working in dimensions of the Spirit and the power and the anointing of God. But right now, raise us beyond the dimension of our flesh and our carnality and put us in the place God to see with your eyes and feel with your heart and know God where this world is headed if this church does not begin to intercede as it's never interceded before God teach us to pray show us where we need to be in this hour in the name of Jesus can you clap your hands one more time reach over shake somebody's hand and said the desperate the desperate laugh Last call. The desperate last call. You can be seated. And just for a few moments, the heaviness I come to this pulpit tonight may not be befitting of this homecoming. I hope you will bear with me tonight. I, I don't know if you've had Brother Hart around very long. You'll know that I, am, I just want to please God. I want His Spirit to walk among us. I want us to have a Holy Ghost time. I want the Holy Ghost to take over the service and break every burden and tear down every fetter. But beyond all that, I'd like to reach the church into a dimension in this hour where we can literally see through God's eyes. And this in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He was God all by Himself. He needed no help. He needed nobody to help Him. He began to create heaven and earth. And He made a perfect plan. He did not make a predestinated people. He did not make a predestinated individual to go to heaven or hell. But he made a predestinated plan that whosoever believeth on the Son of God, repent and be baptized and receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost would have a promise beyond this veil of tears and beyond a capsized fallen earth vessel. You would be able to have a new body like unto his. And you'd see him because it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when he appears we shall be like him. But we 
we shall see him as he is. Hold him in the total glory of his power and his anointing. And yea, we will rise up with power like we have never known before in the earth. Come on, clap your hands, somebody, to the Lord. Oh, God. I look at our world knowing He is creator of heaven and earth. Knowing that every child that's ever been born is His. Yes. They called it a speckled bird. I'm not sure why. But I'm convinced of this. All of God's children are His. Red or yellow, black or white. Doesn't matter whether... I've seen some children I probably wouldn't want. Hello? I walked down the street the other, head, the other day and saw a dope head. Had 14 strands and 14 different colors of hair. All of them springing up into different places. I thought, Lord, I'd hate for that to be my child. Come on, I'm sure. Come on, don't look at me funny. You've looked down the street and walked down the street and said, Man, I'm glad that ain't my child. I look at my own son sometimes. I said, I don't know if you're mine or not. He's 30 plus years old and, and he's a good boy. But sometimes when you look at him, you wonder where in the world did you come from? What kind of decision? Where did you get your upbringing? Where did, and I wonder tonight, as God looks over America and Indonesia and Africa and Asia and all the land, as he sees the unrighteousness and the ungodliness, I wonder if he shakes his head. I was praying, I said, God, do you shake your head and say, I'm glad that one's not mine. No, I begin, he began to say, Lord, I am not willing that any will perish. God has never shook his head at one drug addict, at one prostitute, at one hearted, and said, they're not mine. He's never shook his head and said, you're not mine. But he opened his arms and said, you're mine. I've sealed you under the day of redemption and he claims us all by his blood come on somebody shout hallelujah he has not refused any of us brother Neil when he found you you wasn't even worth considering to be saved I don't know brother Wolford that well but I know this some of y'all tonight was in the same situation half of our world is in. Drunken, despair, hated yourself, hated everybody around you. And yet God, through His loving, kind mercy, reached out for you when you should have been killed on the spot. When He should have took the rags of the filthiness and cast you into eternity lost. But He didn't shake His head and walk away from you and say, you're not mine, Neil. No, sir. He opened His arms and said, come on home, son. Come on. I just made a home coming for you. I just made a way for you. I just cleared the path to eternity for you. And while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for the ungodly. And that was me. And that was you. And that was our world. Can you shout hallelujah? And so, on a tall mountain, he looks over. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I thought, God, give me the power to preach this. This might be somebody's last homecoming. Preachers have quit preaching against hell or about hell. They preach so much grace and mercy. But I got news for you. Mercy and grace will turn your heart to love and truth. It will give you. I never seen grace turn the spirit of God into disgrace. When his grace reaches to a world and a church begins to intercede, Jesus on the mountain began to say, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you? 
It's not God shaking his head and saying, you're not mine. It's the world shaking their head saying, we don't want you. We don't want you, Jesus. We don't want you, God. Come on. I'm talking about they're strung out on dope and dope head and, and all the crack cocaine and all the mess of the world. So intrigued with a ball game and a pig skin that they can't even come to church when it's church time. They're intrigued by everything in the world but the power and the presence of an almighty creator. Come on. It's not God shaking his head. It's the world shaking their head in rejection, saying, We do not want you, we don't desire you, and we don't want anything to do with you. Oh God, if he prayed this way over a Jewish church without the Holy Ghost. How do you think he's weeping over a Gentile church that has been adopted in contrary to nature? How do you think God is feeling about you tonight? Oh yeah, come on, that's enough to think about. How do you think God is feeling about you tonight? And yet, rather than getting, rather to get closer to Him, rather coming to church and pray more, rather than getting to church early and staying late, rather than finding a place of prayer, we got a YouTube now. Boy, they used to preach against TV. I like to preach against YouTube for a little while. And y'all, y'all know what that is. Anybody I know? I guess you do. Hey Amen. Y'all forgive me if I stay. I'm not saying that it's not a good thing. But I'm telling you this. We're so wrapped up and tied up and tangled up in a world of ungodliness and filthiness. And we feed our flesh daily. But our spirit hungers for one move of the Holy Ghost. What happened to the night? What happened to the day when we prayed and we sought God? And we come through the door shouting and we left shouting how come we gotta be cheerleading and pumped up and primed up I'm telling you this word is still powerful it's still mighty it's still creative it's still off come on it has all authority under heaven and earth I feel like preaching a little while somebody hear me we gotta catch on fire we need more passion to praise Him. We need more fervency to worship Him. We need to feel more of the genuine burning sensation of the Spirit of God. This is not a rebuke, I'm telling you. We need to understand we are the church of God in the earth. We're His hands. We're His feet. We're His tongue. God help these apostolics if we're the tongue of God. Backbite, curse, come on, gossip, decipher division everywhere you go. No good word, no positive thoughts. Everything's negative. I'm not preaching negative tonight. I'm telling you, we're the tongue of God. And if we're the tongue of God, oh, hear me tonight. Let us magnify His name and exalt Him forever. Let's stop all the sin and the filth and the curse and the detribution of filthiness and let our communication be holy. How come we'll preach holiness everywhere but for our tongue? Hello? Oh boy, y'all get, don't get quiet on me. I'll get nervous. Come on, it ain't holy socks. It, I, got, I used to wear some of them. Amen. And it ain't holy britches. And the world's got some holy britches now. I thought to my little, somebody working for me that I said, Do you know? They used to, he, I said, you know you got a hole in your knee? So he said, yeah, I bought them like that. And he said, I paid extra for them. I said, I wish I had my closet. Amen. When I was a young man, because that could have made me some money. Amen. Because my brother wore them, 
my other brother wore them and then I was a fun man mama I wore them too praise God by the time I got them they had holes in them I thought I cried because I had holes in my britches I went out ashamed but now they put holes in them everywhere and feel like they've accomplished something where is our sense of come on where is our sense of reverence and fear of the almighty God in this hour Woo! Brother Wolford, I don't know if you taught me that or I taught you that. Somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, I feel like fighting the devil tonight. He's a liar. He's a thief. Full of guile. Full of imperfection. Full of ungodliness and unrighteousness. But Jesus bowed in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, oh God. Kind of remind me of the prayer. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He begged for his people a while. But his people wouldn't hear him. So what are you going to do if the people won't hear you? I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to do exactly what Jesus did. You're going to find you a place called Gethsemane. And if the people won't receive you, cry to the people. If the people won't hear you, then cry to God. Because that's what he did. He hid himself away. And he said, I've already cried, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, where art thou? They wouldn't hear me. They turned their ears away. So now, God, I'm calling on you in this little place that I am. My disciples have forsaken me. They walked out on me. Here they are sleeping. We got a bunch of sleeping disciples in the apostolic assemblies. Come on, we are one God. Apostolic, Holy Ghost, water baptized, sanctified, Holy Ghost people. Hallelujah. Can you shout hallelujah? Woo! Oh, praise God. I feel like praising Him right now in the house. I preach to people till I'm almost sick of preaching to them. Come on, y'all to say, well, Brother Hart, isn't that rude? No. You preach to them and shoot spit wads, get on their cell phone and text, and now I've got all that other garbage. I think they need a collection box back at the door when you come in. They ought to take all the cell phones and all the iPods and all the mess that's in your life and leave it back outside the door. Leave the coloring books. Leave everything. Come on. I'm talking about a Holy Ghost people that want to catch on fire. What happened to praise? What happened to revival? What happened to the glory of the atmosphere of worship that moved God from heaven to earth and set us aflame with praise? Somebody ought to praise Him. So God, I hope your telephone don't ring during my preaching because I'm probably going to baptize your phone. We don't have no water. I'll tell you what, if it rings or I catch them texting next Sunday, I'm going to run me some water in that hawk trough or horse trough, whatever it is. I don't have a fancy baptism like this. But I'm going to say, here's water. What doth hinder me from defying this spirit that come in the house? I got the Holy Ghost. It's been a while. My hair's turning gray, Brother Roger. Amen. But ain't lost no far here. Amen. I still, man, if it keeps getting better, I'm going to probably outdance mama when I get 81. Amen. Ooh. Hallelujah. You better get you an example that you can follow. Thank God for a mama that can shout at 81. Come on. I didn't have a drug dealer for a mama. I didn't have a street walker for my mama. I had a one God, apostolic, Holy Ghost mama feel, and I'm proud of her tonight. Why wouldn't I brag on her? Why wouldn't I testify about her? Come on, I got somebody that knows how to give me a heritage beyond a cell phone and a bank account. My God, she give me the power to preach the word of God, the instant in season and out of season. Come on, praise him one more time. I got to hurry. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't we brag on our mamas, daddies? 
I tell you what. I'm sick of Pentecostal kids. They got football heroes. Every kind of hero you can imagine. But their little silver gray headed grandma that's been praying in the closet for them for years and years. They won't even go visit her. Won't even dart in. Oh, I'm preaching good. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Watch a ball game for four hours. Kentucky or whoever it might be. I mean, not in Kentucky, am I? West Virginia. Praise God. Watch a four-hour ball game. And won't even go visit your grandmother or your mother. Won't pick up a Bible and read. Come on, I'm talking to somebody tonight. We ought to get a burden. We got to get an intercessory prayer. We got to have a desperate last call to our world before it burns in hell for eternity. Here Jesus is. So I'm asking you. Pray for your sons. Pray for your daughters. I I hope 2010 homecoming. This is just the first night, my Lord. We're we're having a great time already. Uh, Tomorrow night, y'all will be able to shout this place apart. Amen. Might have to put some nails in that piece of wood up there. I've seen it shaking a while ago. Amen. But I'm telling you, friend, if we don't start taking some of this stuff out of these four walls and putting it in the streets and in the kids, come on, your grandkids need to know how to pray. They need to know how to seek God. They know how. You know what to say? Well, I know, but they're divorced. They got four different husbands and four. I know where they're coming from. I come. I never come from a broken home. My mama was married for years. I don't know what it is to have a divorced family, but I'm pretty sure Jesus understands the brokenness of it. So you're not the first one that's come from a family of divorcees. So come on, stand up, shape up, and understand. That Jesus is the answer, not the enemy of your problem. Come on, clap your hands to the Lord. I got enough. I got enough time. How long I got? Praise God. I'm I'm under distress tonight. I'm perplexed. I know folks think they're working for God and they're working for the enemy. Amen. I remember a man in the Bible whose name was Samson. Had the most expensive haircut in history. Hello? Said he had the most expensive haircut in history. Got a haircut and it cost him his eyes. Cost him his life. Cost him everything he had. Come on. Somebody say amen. Amen. But what gets me, how the devil works is he deceives you, cuts off the lock. That's the anointing. You know what? I've seen people play with the anointing just to see how far they can take it into the world and still stay anointed. Oh, yeah. Come on. Let me see how many. They'll say, let me see how many movies I can watch. Let me see how many ball games I can go to. Oh, I know y'all. Come on. Can you say amen? Let me see how close to the world. And I'm not just preaching to just things tonight. Don't misunderstand me. I'm telling you, we got to get closer to God than we do the world. We got to worship more and be distracted less. We got to stand in the gap and make up the hedge and understand that God is willing to cut you you off if you are not able to stand in the hedge you're the weakest link he'll cut you off and so we got a Samson plays with the locks on his head oh Delilah Delilah bundle him up in seven locks yeah he still had his anointing you ever seen somebody man they can play the guitar play the drums then they start listening to all this other mess and they, and they start playing the drums to the other mess. That's a while. I, I've seen them leave the church house and go to the moose hall. And then they play in the church a while and play in the moose hall or a club. Or, I'm going to tell you something. God is so jealous. If you're going to play for him, you better get in his house, play for him, and leave that other mess alone. Can you shout hallelujah? 
So now Samson's got seven. He still got his anointing. He shook himself. But this time, he let it out of the bag. And she cut off his hair. And when she cut off his hair, he lost his anointing. And he shook himself as he did before. But now, what happens after you're deceived and lose your anointing and you lose your vision? Once your anointing's gone, you won't have any vision. Your vision will be gone. That's why you need a pastor that's anointed. If, you're, if your pastor's lost his anointing, he's about to lose his vision. It's this way. Praise God. Somebody shout, it's this way. Amen. I'm telling you, once somebody loses their anointing, they're about to lose their vision. And once you lose your vision, they'll strap you to the side of a grinding mill and you will be grinding all that to get to here. Brother Roger, because now he is grinding at the mill of his enemy and that which he thought would work for God, he's now begun to work for his adversary. And every ounce of meal that he makes puts money in the pocket of his enemy. Some of y'all think you're doing service for God, but you're just putting pockets full in the devil's pocket. I'm not here for a payday. I'm not here to see how much money I can get. I'm not here for a drama. I'm here to tell you the anointing breaks the yoke. Don't lose your vision and quit working for the adversary of your soul. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord. Oh yes. I refuse. To push the grind and mill for the enemy. Oh, he didn't have no choice. Didn't have no vision. Lost his anointing. And still trying to have church. What good is church? Without anointing. Come on. Anointing is not all run and shout and dance. Anointing travels with you when you're out in the world on the job. Some people think the anointing's a 30-minute boost in your ability to sing. Forget it, friend. Anointing goes with you when you lay down at night. Anointing goes with you when you look across the supper table and your husband slams the cornbread down and says, This is all we got tonight. Yeah, bless God, couldn't we get something else? And live like angels and dance like angels in church and go home and live like the devil. Cuss and fight and rip and roll and all the mess that goes on. Call the pastor for prayer in the wee hours in the morning because you're all confused. Said, oh, Pastor Hart, the devil got in my pictures. The devil flew the pictures off the wall. I said, no, the devil got in that box back there and no spirits got on you. You need to destroy the spirit of hell that's come out of the world come on we cannot entertain the devil and the Lord at the same time we gotta get a burden we gotta get a desire we gotta get a passion we gotta get holy we gotta get right we gotta stand informed of God so here we are Working for the devil. How be it? The hair of his head began to grow again. There's hope for you, folks. There's hope for you, Brother Neil. Praise God. Because I don't care how far you went or how many devils you had, you'd yield to two to get there. I had a murder in my church just came up three weeks ago. And he cried and he begged God and he said and I, I don't know if y'all are taping this or not but I got to be careful I tell you what he begged God said how in the world can God forgive me come on we're past the age when sin was little sin is great big sin is ugly sin is desperate but I'm asking you the greater sin is the more abundant his mercy is and where sin did abound the grace of God did the much more abound I'm here to tell
say uh, he can forgive to the uttermost. Uh, it doesn't matter. The harlots, uh, the whoremongers, the drug addicts, uh, it doesn't matter. God's grace uh, is able to replace uh, the sin uh, with grace and power. Clap your hands one more time. Give the Lord. Ooh, I feel like running. I feel like dancing a little while. Praise God. Is that all right? Praise God. I feel like I'm giving a desperate last call. 2010 homecoming has brought us places I never thought I'd see. Never thought I'd see a nation $13 trillion in debt. I never thought I'd see a president who would say and be ashamed to pray to the very God that made him. I never thought I'd see a president that wouldn't go to church and, hello, somebody shout hallelujah. Ain't been to church, ain't going to church, but he's got Muslim friends and he's got Muslim everything else. I'm pretty convinced he's Muslim, but I believe God is getting ready to speak to America. He's getting ready to put in and take down. It doesn't matter who's president, who's governor. It doesn't matter. God says it's nothing to me. I put him in, I take him out. God's getting ready to make a desperate call to America in these last fleeting Hours of our lives. Because we're living in the last seconds of the last minutes of the last hours of the last years. We used to might have had time to goof off and play games and do all kinds of domino stuff. Boy, I hate when church people play domino games. Hello? Come on, can you preach with me just a little longer? What's a domino game? It's when you fall and they fall and the person behind you fall and you love to see the domino effect. Because in 2010, church people ain't satisfied with killing themselves. They want to kill everybody else around them. They want to get bitter and angry and jealous and envious. And they're not satisfied to backslide by themselves. They want half the church to backslide. So what do they have to do to get somebody to backslide? They'll do it. Amen. If it's make up a lie about you, they'll make it up. Come on, somebody help me preach a little while. It doesn't matter. They'll lie. They'll cheat. They'll connive. And they'll try to destroy the man of God. Come on. God has got his people protected. But it's time for the church people to step up to the plate and say, leave my pastor alone. You leave your lips off my pastor. You leave your hands off my pastor. You leave my pastor alone. He's a one God. God called man of God. So, hey, 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 somebody ought to help me. And they want to play. If they want to play dominoes in the house of God, the Sunday school teacher is not guilty, so quit talking about her. Some of you men of God ought to stand up and stop the domino effect. Somebody said, oh, they so-and-so come to me and said this. Boy, am I preaching too hard? Praise God. They said, man, somebody so-and-so come and told me this, and everybody around just start falling like dominoes. You ought to be the one to stand up and hold up your hand and say, that's the end of that game. I'm not going to hear it. I'm not. Come on. I'm preaching for just a little while tonight. Amen. It's time to stop the games that cause everybody else to stumble in the house and backslid and backsliding because of your ignorance and the things that you're doing in the house of God. Want to start more junk than you can stop. Amen. It's time for the church to take the role of intercessor. I'm going to start interceding. My mama used to pray for me so hard in the closet. I'd go knock on the closet door and say, Mom, pray for Bob a while. Come on. I mean, she'd cry, cry my name out. I'd get tired of listening to it. I go knock on the door and say, Mom, pray for Elmer a while. There's four of us boys. But no need for me to, for her to pray for me all the time. I don't know how many kids you got, but y'all to spread it out a little bit, amen. 
Praise God. But I think what she's doing, she must have been praying for us one at a time. Because at 16 and a half, something come out of that closet and got up on the hill on squatting down the way to Quinwood. That's about 27 miles away. The prayers got out of her closet, made its way 27 miles to the top of a hill at a little place called Squatting Dodge. And a man of God got in the pulpit and preached a message. And I was sitting on the back row to the right, mischievous as I could be. But that prayer got out of the closet 27 miles up that hill and that night when that man gave the altar call it pricked my heart it got a hold of me I couldn't run out the door I couldn't leave I had to get on the altar and I prayed and I sought God I'm here to tell you prayer has no distance prayer has no limitations when you pray in your closet God will openly reward you on the hill of squatting Dodge Road and the anointing will break the sin in your children life because you prayed and sought God amen I gotta I gotta hurry somebody shout hallelujah Jesus what are you doing up there so long finally oh Samson killed more in his death than he did in his whole life that's kind of refreshing. Come on, backslider. It ain't over for you. Well, so-and-so told me if I backslide, I'll probably never get back to God. Tell so-and-so to leave you alone because Jesus is still saving the unsaved. Jesus is still reaching the unreachable, touching the untouchable. Going beyond the call of the flesh. I'm telling you, God has touched people that I could never touch with my hands or my voice or my eyes. And though, Sister Dylan, I have wept bitterly and tears have flooded the, the floor where I bowed. I could not touch them. I begged God for their soul, but nothing happened. But I kept on weeping and I kept on praying. And Mama, sometimes as many as 16 and 14 years. I don't know if y'all know, Brother Neil knows Brother Marty. Amen. Oh, Brother Marty, down at Brother Harris's, I prayed for that boy seven years. I went to his dinner table every year for seven years. And the last night, Brother, Brother Neil, I walked in there. I said, Marty, if you don't come to church tonight, I'm not coming back to your house anymore. He said, Brother Hart, you're telling me a story. You're always going to come and eat, son. I said, no, this is the last time. If you don't come to church, I'm not coming back to your house. And he I, he couldn't believe it. He said, I don't have but one suit. Amen. I said, that's all you need. You don't even need a suit to come. And so, Brother Neil might remember the night. We started service. And I waited for Brother Marty to come. He didn't come. First 15 minutes. Second 30 minutes. He didn't come. But after a while, he came in. There he came. Sitting on the left side of the church. Oh, Marty Sullivan. I wish you here I'd pull his old rotten hair a little bit if he's got any amen and listen to me friend I'm here to tell you he came down there and sat on the left I gave one altar call he wouldn't come I gave another altar call and he still wouldn't come I looked at brother Harris Harris looked at me brother Harris looked at me and said well you better I think he kind of was saying you better quit but I gave one more altar call and about that time old brother Marty let go of his seat and down the aisle he came. He fell on his face repented of his sins. Friend, about three minutes he prayed about three minutes got up off of his seat, got up off of his knees, run and jumped in the baptismal tank, suit clothes and all and said baptize me in the name of Jesus. Brother Harris baptized him. I'm here to tell you there's hope for the backslider. There's hope for the sinner. There's hope for the hopeless. There's hope for the neglected. Drug addicts. Everybody in this town has hope in the Lord God of heaven. Clap your hands one more time to the Lord. The last desperate call. If I knew 
There was one of you in here tonight that was going to walk out of this service, backslide, or lose your life before repenting of your sins and being baptized and receiving the Holy Ghost. I'd hold you all to midnight. You say, yeah, but he's the pastor. Yeah, I know he is. But God's going to talk to him and God talked to me. I was preaching in Nashville just a while back. <laughs> the service ended. It was 9.30 or something. <clears throat> and the Spirit of God came in that house. Conviction rolled on them people. And nobody said a word. For one solid hour. We just sat there. I was on the platform, Pastor. That's on the platform. But we were, we were scared to say the power of God was so intense. I mean, it gave me, I felt my hair stand. I mean, we just all, there was about 100, 125 people there. We all sat for one solid hour. You say, how that? I mean, we closed our eyes. We opened them. We looked around at everybody. But not one person said one single thing for one solid hour. And when it came one hour to the minute, to the time that we had been sitting there, one old boy all the way to the back stood up and screamed as loud as he could and ran to the altar and gave himself to the Lord. Silence got a hold of him. Conviction got a hold of him. I'm telling you, God is able to work beyond your small mind. God don't always work like you think he does. They may not even, you might not even know they're under conviction. You might not even know God's dealing with them. But God is giving them one desperate call before they are Lost without God. I have preached. In just a few more minutes I have preached. About Zacchaeus my whole life. But God woke me up the other night about Zacchaeus. And he said I want you to read about Zacchaeus. I said good Lord. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. First song I ever read. Or first song I ever learned. I went to Sunday school, believe it or not. I might have been mean as a Dickens, but I went to Sunday school. My Sunday school teacher said to my mother, said, that kid's in more trouble than anybody else in the class. My grandmama prayed for me. She, my mama would spank me, and my grandmama would say, leave that boy alone. He's my preacher. She'd say, that boy's too mean to be a preacher. So I'm going to tell y'all kids something. If you're mean, you better quit being mean because that's who God calls to preach. Oh boy, hallelujah. Oh, I felt anointed on that. Praise God. And some of you mean kids, boy, God's going to get after you. If I was you, I'd straighten up before I got called to preach. Here I am tonight, 37 years later, still preaching. Amen. The last call. He said, go read Zacchaeus again. Okay, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. But the Lord said, no, that's not what I want you to learn. I said, okay, Lord, the sycamore tree. Zacchaeus climbed the sycamore tree. He said, no. I, I often wonder, I said, why did Zacchaeus climb a sycamore tree? And the Lord, I got to researching that thing, and I found out that Zacchaeus was so short that an oak tree leaves and limbs were high. And a sycamore tree is the lowest limbs they are. So God had to create a tree with low limbs for a little short guy. It's because the sycamore tree has the lowest limbs to the ground. God will save you where you are if he has to make a special tree for you. Come on, help me preach this a little while longer. Somebody said, oh, my neighbor, my neighbor will never get saved. You better watch out. God will make a bridge for that neighbor to be saved. Amen. God's in the bridge building business. Come on, he's not in the bridge burning business. He's in the bridge building business. And no wonder you preached about the gap the other night because the bridge fills the gap. Calvary fills the gap. And Jesus will make a way where there literally seems to be no way. So Zacchaeus... Got a hold of the sycamore tree. But the Lord spoke and said, No, that's not what I want you to know either. 
He said, I want you to understand something. Zacchaeus was desperate to see God. I would that God would get some desperates in the house of God. <laughs> if we had some desperate sinners in the house, you wouldn't care how long you prayed. You wouldn't care if your eyes weep like a tree and a willow tree and fall down. I tell you what, it, it ought to get a hold of you, you literally, you, you literally suck the air out of your lungs to call on the name of Jesus. Little Tilly Winks prayer, oh Jesus help me. If you're going to dance, just go ahead and dance with everything you got. Run with everything you got. Cry with everything you got. Pray with everything you got. Sister Dylan ought to be in the dictionary under the word vervent. Sister Dylan ought to be there. Her name ought to be there. She does everything she's got with all of her might, all of her strength, everything that's within her. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. But I'm going to tell you, in closing tonight, Zacchaeus was almost the last person Jesus ever talked to. One of the last people that Jesus ever conversed with was Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus didn't know how desperate he was. Because I'm telling you, he would never get another chance to talk to Jesus again. It was the last desperate call to Zacchaeus. And when, Z when Jesus had dipped the sop, as they come to the instruments tonight. As Jesus had dipped the sop. Anybody know what dipping the sop means? When Jesus finally dipped the sop. I studied about the sop just a little bit. Some most people say it was just a piece of bread dipped in some broth. But the sop was more than that. Sop was brought from the time of the Passover. They did it all the way through the Old Testament till they got to the New Testament. And the sop was made out of a horseradish. It was so strong that when you dipped it and put it in your mouth, it would literally burn your tongue and your mouth and make tears run from your eyes. It was a reminder of the bitterness of Egypt. That's how bitter it was. It was so bitter and so anguishing that literally it was something that would move you to tears. None of the other apostles in the place knew what was happening. But when Judas dipped the last sop, the last bitterness, I'm telling you that God above and the Lord God of heaven himself was desperately trying to make a last call to Judas. Maybe. If I can turn Judas to conviction. Maybe if I can make him weep one more time. Before I give up on you Judas. Before I let you leave out of here. Nobody else knew he was under conviction. Nobody else knew that Jesus was trying to convict Judas of their sins. No other man knew in the house what God was doing in that sop. And he dipped the sop for the final time. Y'all with me just for one more moment? Brother Roger, I'm telling you, the God of heaven through the crying, weeping Son of God in a little room where he had just washed his feet. Man, I'm telling you, not only gave him sop, but he washed his feet. God has entertained your sin long enough. God has dealt with your heart long enough. Some of you right here tonight are going to get your last call. You say, yeah, my brother heart, everybody in here saved. How do you know that? 
How do you know their heart's not far away? How do you know they're not cold and indifferent? How do you know right now I'm not going to stir something in them that causes them to come down to an old-fashioned altar and find the Holy Ghost and the power of God one more time in their life? And so, one final time, Jesus dips the sop. And Judas puts it in his mouth. Tears probably dripping down his eyes, not because of conviction. But because the sop is strong. You can't dip with Jesus and not get under some kind. Conviction. You can't sit in a meeting like this and not feel God somehow, somewhere. Oh, I feel Him so powerful right now. I pray for your sister. I pray for your aunt. I pray for your mother, your father, your your husband. I pray for your daughter and your sons. Because my last desperate call tonight. In homecoming 2010. It's Wednesday night. We got a few We got a few more services left. But brother Neil. This might be somebody's last call. To eternity. The Bible said as soon as he dipped the sop. The tears breaked up in his eyes. But he held them back. He, he fought them back. Judas wouldn't weep. I got a mission. I'm, I'm going to sell this Jesus. I'm going to sell out Jesus. I'm fixing to leave this place. And as soon as he dipped the sop, Satan, the spirit, what it really means is the will to follow Satan entered into him. He made the choice that moment. Somebody said, away, he's possessed of the devil. No, he made his mind up that moment to listen to Satan. And he left there under the leadership of Satan. Some of y'all tonight, you won't get possessed by Satan, but you'll leave this meeting with your mind made up that you're going to go do your thing and make your way in the world. You're not coming to that altar no matter what Brother Hart or Brother Wolfer does. But I'm going to tell you, it's a dangerous thing to dip the sop. Feel conviction swell up in your eyes. Some of you right now, are you're, you're catching. you got a lump in your throat right now. You feel some working on you that hadn't worked on you for a long time. The prayer of the woman of God is touching you. You feel something springing up right now. You literally feel like if you don't get out of this place, you're going to burst. You got the Jesus feeling all over you. And you need to come this way, not go that way. Come on, I know what I'm talking about. You got the Jesus feeling. Don't run out of here with the Jesus feeling all over you. Get on the altar. Talk to God while it's on you. And as we stand tonight, why did Judas sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver? Why in the world just 30 pieces? Brother Wolford, he could have got a whole lot more than that out of Jesus. He could have got five, ten more times. It's crazy to me what people sell Jesus out for. One night in a motel for a fornicated fornication. I've got preachers all over the country that have lost out with God because they sell out for one night. Why did he sell him for 30 pieces of silver? Because it was a sin of convenience. That's what he could get at that time. He didn't have time. I watch people every day trade Jesus just for the convenience of trading him. It's coal mines. They'll go work and never think, oh, I'm working, I'm working. I've seen them sell out Jesus for a job. I've seen them sell out Jesus for a car. I've seen him sell out Jesus for a job. Young lady come to me and said, Preacher, pray for me. 
please pray for me. I got a child. I'm, I'm with a child. I, I'm not even married. How come you wait till you get in trouble to pray? Why don't you pray before you get in trouble? Why do you sell out Jesus for a convenient? I had a woman who was preaching in Louisiana. She had a daughter. She came to the church. She said, no way. No way my daughter's not coming to this Holy Roller Church. No way. No way. I'll do anything I have to to get my daughter out of this church. She took her out. The Holy Ghost was all over. She was weeping. She was crying. She was feeling the presence of God. She almost had the Holy Ghost. But her mama come in, her, drug her out of the church, and said, I won't let her be in this Holy Roller Church. She said, baby, anything you want, anything you want, you can have it. She said, okay, mama, I want a candy apple red Z28 Camaro. She said, I'll go to the bank tomorrow. I'll borrow the money. I'll get you whatever you want. She went to the bank the next day. She got the brand new title. She brought the title. Brand new candy apple red Z28 Camaro. Brought it and showed it to the pastor. Said, my daughter won't be coming back to your church anymore. Because she got a brand new Camaro. Brand new. What would you sell out Jesus for? Just a few weeks later, in her bedroom that night, her mama thought she was in the bed. But in that brand new Z28 Camaro, she had slipped out the back window. Met her boyfriend, and her boyfriend was driving that brand new Z28 Camaro down the highway. We went down the road, brother. Brother Wolford and Pastor Henson said, "What is, what is that over in the field? A woman bowed over weeping. They didn't even tell us. Bowed over weeping. They said, that's that little girl that left church. Her boyfriend run that Z28 Camaro into a train. And it threw her body all over the road. That's a true story. I'm telling you, she slipped out the window. Mama went to find her, but she's in the hospital. They said that literally, they had to dig her mother away from the casket. Fingernails tore off. Please don't let my baby go to hell. Please don't let my baby go to hell. But I sold my baby out for a Z28. I wonder tonight, some of y'all, under the sound of my voice, what are you selling Jesus out for in your life? With every head bowed and every eye closed, right now I feel God in this place. I wonder if you're lost, would you please come? Right now, while nobody's looking, I want you to get out of your seat. I want the lump in your throat and the tears in your eyes to be the last desperate call. But I want you backslider to understand tonight. Right now, young lady, do you hear me? Young man, will you hear me? Please don't leave this place. There's some young people in this church tonight. You might be seven. You might be eight. You might be 12. You might be 13. I don't know how old you are. I don't know how young you are. Young man, God spoke to you. Young lady, God spoke to you. And right now, under the sound of my voice, God is calling to a sinner, a backslider, a lost soul. And God, with his last desperate ounce of conviction, tears welling up. Could y'all play something softly just for a moment? Hope this is all right, brother. I'm giving you an altar call in one moment's time. God didn't shake his head and say, I don't want you. Your father didn't walk out on you, your heavenly father, and tell you, no, I don't want you anymore. No matter how broken and hurt you are right now, no matter what you're going through in your life, please don't shake your head tonight and walk out on him. I plead the blood of Jesus right now. And as Brother Wolford comes to this platform, I'd like for you to raise your hands and pray for every lost soul. Oh, I feel God. I feel conviction.